I have this simple image here with some colorful shapes. What do you think will happen if I convert them to black and white? Well, let's find out. I'll add a black and white adjustment here. And they all disappeared. So if I toggle my adjustment on and off, you can see they appear and disappear. So why does that happen? Well, it turns out black and white isn't as simple as it looks. So let's figure out why. What's up guys, it's Trent, and today we're talking about the black and white adjustment layer in Affinity Photo. This also applies to Affinity Designer and Publisher. Now for this video, I'm gonna assume you know how an adjustment layer works, but if not, I'll put a link here to my introduction video. So I have this colorful diagram here, and I'll add a black and white adjustment layer to it. I'll select the adjustment layer here, and select black and white, and it turns all white. So this might be unexpected to you if you haven't experienced this before. So in the black and white adjustment layer, we have all these sliders here, and if I move them up, nothing really happens. But if I move them down, you can see stuff starting to show up. So these are the colors we can adjust. They're red, green, and blue, and cyan, yellow, and magenta. So kind of messing around with these sliders, I can get stuff to happen, but what is really the theory behind what we should be doing with this tool? Well, let's start with a brief review of RGB color. RGB color builds other colors using a combination of red, greens, and blues. So we call red, green, and blue our channels, and each of them can have a value from zero to 255. Now the technical reason for this is that each channel is a byte, which means we can have 256 values. And 256 values means we can go from 0 to 255. But that's kind of just besides the point. Just know that the range is 0 to 255 for each of these channels here. And if you've ever used the color picker tool and looked at the numbers, you'll see that we have red, green, and blue options here. And I can change them to different values. But the max I can go to is 255. I can never go beyond that. So here I have some examples of colors. If I keep everything 0 but just modify the first number, that's just different shades of red. And same thing with the greens, except that's the second number and also with the blues being the third number. And then at the bottom, if we mix different combinations of numbers, we'll get other colors. Now, in addition to the red, green, and blue channels, there's also an alpha channel. So sometimes you'll see RGBA mentioned, and that A is for alpha transparency. But I'll just ignore transparency for this video because it's not really relevant. Now, another way of looking at RGB is through HSL color, and that stands for hue, saturation, luminosity. Now I have this red square here. As we know, for RGB, it's going to have fully red at 255 and then 00, 0 for green and blue. But its HSL looks a little bit different. Its HSL is 0, 150. Now the important thing to know is that all data is stored in RGB values. HSL is just another way of looking at it. So it's kind of like how one mile is the same as 1.6 kilometers. They both represent the same thing. It's just a different way of measuring. Let me bring up the color picker here. So here we have RGB on the left and HSL on the right. The reason HSL is nice is because we can actually change the lightness and saturation independently. So for example, I can change the saturation here with this slider and I can make it more gray or I can make it more fully saturated. I can also change the lightness so I can make it really bright or I can make it really dark. But notice when I adjust these values, notice that the RGB is changing also. Because once again, they're just the same data but we're viewing it in a different way. So with RGB, it would be very hard for me to adjust these values to change lightness. I don't really know how to do that, but with HSL, it's very easy. Now the hue value, you can actually think of it as degrees going around a color circle. And you don't have to remember what all of these mean, but it is good to remember that red is zero degrees. Let me bring up the color picker again. So in Affinity, I can actually change the color picker here. Let's do HSL color wheel. So you can see when H is zero, I'm pointing at red. That means zero degrees is red. And if I go to like 270 degrees, that's this purple here. And I can move it all the way around, 180 degrees. You can see 180 degrees is halfway around the circle. And there's no coincidence that cyan is opposite of red. We'll look at that more later. But if I keep going around, it eventually goes back to zero. So I wanted to introduce you to HSL because that will be relevant later. Let's go look at some more details about RGB. So let's look at some special colors here. You can see red, green, and blue obviously are kind of special colors because it's 255, 0, 0, and combinations of that. Black you can see is all zeros, and white is all 255s. So when we max out all the channels, we get white because it's an additive color system. Now there's also three other colors that are pretty important. And if you look at the numbers here, you can kind of guess what they are. And that is the complements of each of these colors. So in other words, what if we switched the zeros and 255s here? Well, in that case, we'd get our cyan, magenta, and yellow. So you can see cyan is 0, 255, 255, whereas red is 255, 0, 0. Green is the opposite of magenta, and blue and yellow are the opposites of each other. Now you've probably seen these relationships before, of red being opposite cyan and so forth. For example, let's look at the color balance adjustment. You can see that cyan and red are opposite ends of the slider. Same thing with magenta and green and yellow and blue. 
That's not a coincidence. Okay, so let's go back to our special colors here. There's one other situation we should know about, which is what happens when red and green and blue are the same. Well, we have kind of a hint if you look at our black and whites over here. Blacks are all zero, whites are all 255s. What about when they all share some other value? Well, that's when we get gray. So here I have probably the least colorful demo in this video. But you can see that these are all levels of gray when RGB is all the same. So if I hover my color picker over them, you'll see that's 120, 120, 120. In fact, let's go to the color picker tool. Let's go back to this view. You can see that whenever I slide along this left corner here, I'm getting a gray value and the RGBs are all the same. So I can move it up and down. The top is white, of course. The bottom is black. And everything in between when it's the same is going to be gray. Okay, so now the big question, how many colors can we possibly have? Well, the answer is about 16 million. So the math there is just 256 cubed because that's how many combinations we have across our three channels. Now, a bigger question is how many levels of gray do we have? Well, the answer there is 256. So whenever we convert to black and white, we have to take possibly 16 million colors and convert them to 256 levels of gray. That's quite a hard problem and it's not easy to solve actually. There's many different ways to do it, so let's explore some of them. So I have this original image here, and it's a colorful wall painting. Let's look at three different ways I could make this black and white. First, I'll reduce the saturation to zero. So I'll just add an HSL adjustment, and I'll reduce the saturation. And we can see it is black and white. Another thing I could do is add a gradient map to it, so let's do that. Gradient map. And I could make it go from black on one end and I can make it go to white on the other end. Now, if you look at it, you can already see a difference happening. For example, this paint here is darker than over here. Let's add the actual black and white adjustment as a third way. So I'll select this. Select the adjustment, black and white. And here you can see a drastic difference. It's much brighter than the other two images. So these are three ways I found of converting this color image to black and white. And you can see we got three different results. So this video is about the black and white adjustment layer. Let's understand a little bit more about what it's actually doing. So these are the colors from before, and let me add the black and white adjustment to it. And as you can see, they all turn white. So what is Affinity's algorithm for doing this? Well, it goes back to that HSL concept I was talking about earlier. There's something special about all of these colors. Let me bring up this yellow. What's happening is that when the saturation is 100 and the lightness is 50, that will be converted to white. And if I click on all these different colors, you can see they all have that same setting, saturation 100, lightness 50. In fact, let me add a new color. I'll copy this. Let me just drag it out. And I'll give it some random hue. Let's make it look orange. Now again, the saturation is 100 and the lightness is 50. If I turn the black and white adjustment back on, it will also disappear. Let's do another one. I'll do like a purple here. Once again, the hue is 271, but the saturation is 100 and the lightness is 50. Turn the black and white on again, and they all turn white again. So the black and white adjustment will turn them to white in that situation. Now, as I showed earlier, if I adjust these red levels and I start moving things around, we can get things to display again. And I just kind of randomly move them around, but what do we actually want these numbers to be? Well, let's look at luminosity. Let's look at what I call naive luminosity. So as you can probably tell from the name, this isn't going to be our final result. So let's look at it here. So one way to calculate luminosity is just to add red, green, and blue together and call that luminosity. For, so for example, this green here is 0, 255, 0. The luminosity would just be 255 because that's the sum of these three values. And then the blue, the luminosity would also be 255 because that's what you have for these values here. But this example shows the problem with this approach. And that's that even though all these numbers are accurate, the blue square just feels darker than the green square. And the reason for that is that the human eye just detects blue as being darker than green. This is just the way the human eye perceives color. So what we can actually do is use a weighted formula and adjust these values. So here I have a better luminosity calculation. And what this will do is we'll add 0.3 of the red to 0.6 of the green and 0.1 of the blue. And this is kind of a standard weighting that you'll see a lot of online. There's some slight differences, but I just kind of rounded to whole numbers to make our lives easy. And down here, you can see the new luminosity calculations. Our green is now 153 and our blue is 26. So this formula does a much better job of giving more of a luminosity value to green than it does the same level of blue. And this goes to what I was saying earlier, our eye is more sensitive to green, so we're gonna weigh that more heavily. So let's go back to our black and white adjustment and see how can we actually put this into practice. Okay, so we have our color bars here. Let me add the black and white adjustment, and they all turn white. Let me open up the adjustment layer here. 
So the way we can actually use this formula is to plug these values directly into our sliders here. So let's start, we have 0.3 red, so that would be 30% for the red. 0.6 green, so that would be 60% for the green. And 0.1 blue, so that would be 10% for the blue. And you can see we've started to get our values in here. We have our RGB values back. So disabling it, you can see this is blue, red, green, and we have them back. Now, of course, one of the problems is we're losing our cyan, yellow, and magenta. Well, we can actually derive those values. So remember that yellow is red plus green, cyan is green plus blue, and magenta is red plus blue. And actually, it's quite simple just to add these values to get the result here. So 0 0.3 plus 0 0.6 is 0.9, so I'll make our yellow 90%. I'll make our cyan 70%. And I'll make our magenta 40%. And now you can see with this weighting, we have a nice gradient of dark to lights here with our colors. So this is before, after. Before, after. In fact, I'll copy this adjustment layer. I'll go back to the image I showed you at the beginning of this video. And let me paste in that adjustment layer. And you can see it worked. So this is before, after, and this is with our fixed color adjustments here. Let's look at some image demos. Here I'll use the default black and white adjustment. So I'll turn that on, that's the default black and white adjustment here. Here I'll use my updated one. So this is the change here. Now which one is better will be up to you, but you can see that there's certainly a difference here. Let's look at this more colorful example here. So default is on the left, and new one's on the right. I can definitely see that the default one is a lot brighter, which seems to be the pattern in general. And let's look at these hot air balloons. So I think here you really notice a big difference here. So over here you can really see a difference between these two colors, but over here it just looks all white. So look at the orange and the yellow here. You're really losing a lot of that difference there. Whereas in our corrected one, you're actually seeing the difference in the black and white also. So when you have an image with lots of saturated color, you're really gonna lose a lot of those differences when you convert it to black and white with the default options. So one thing to consider is to use these values I've suggested here as a starting point to keep those contrasts in. Now this black and white feature is a type of adjustment layer. If you wanna learn how all the adjustment layers work, you can check out my deep dive video on that subject. I'll leave a link right here. As always, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.